Have you ever had neck pain that radiates down into your arm and into your fingers? And what finger the pain goes into can indicate to your doctor which nerve may be pinched in your neck. Isn't that crazy? Not only that, but depending on which level in your neck may be compressed, may mean that certain surgeries aren't even an option for you. Yesterday, I presented the case of a 45-year-old man that came to my office with several weeks of pain beginning in his neck and radiating down his arm. His pain radiated down his left arm into primarily his ring finger, but he also noted some triceps weakness when he tried to push objects. He did try some physical therapy, but over the next several weeks, he noticed that his hand dexterity was weak and he even had trouble with his balance, so an MRI of his cervical spine was ordered. When we look at this view of the cervical spine, we are actually facing this way and looking at our neck from the side, so the face is this way and the back of our head is that way. Each one of these squares are the bones that are in the spine, and then this black rectangle here is the disc. The white in front and behind this gray thing is called the spinal fluid, or CSF, and this gray line coming all the way down through here is your spinal cord. On this young man's MRI, he did have several bulging discs, but a biggest concern was this area right here at C7 and T1, where there was compression of the spinal cord, or this area right here where that white spinal fluid seems to be less. We can then look at what's called the axial view, where we take slices across the neck in this direction, and we can look exactly down on the nerve and we see this large left-sided disc herniation. Just for comparison, when we look at an axial view of the cervical spine, we should see the spinal cord right here and all of the white spinal fluid surrounding the cord. That basically means that the spinal cord floats around in there freely without any compression, and the disc would be right here. Compare that to his MRI, where you see that there is no white CSF, which means that his spinal cord is being compressed severely. You combine the knowledge that we gained from his MRI of his cervical spine and his symptoms, he has something called cervical myelopathy. Cervical what? We have a variety of different terms that we use in medicine and it can be somewhat confusing. We use words like cervical spondylosis, stenosis, radiculopathy, myelopathy, so you can see how those words can be quite confusing. The main two things that you need to know the difference between is radiculopathy versus myelopathy. Radiculopathy means that the nerve is being pinched and not necessarily the entire spinal cord. This is an illustration of a disc herniation pinching on one single nerve as it exits out the spine going down the arm. That's in comparison to a disc herniation that's more centrally located and can push posteriorly into the spinal canal, compressing the spinal cord. In medicine, we treat radiculopathy way different than we treat myelopathy. That's because myelopathy means that the spinal cord is compressed and typically that's a surgically treated condition because compression on the cord itself cannot wait once a patient has symptoms. That's because the longer you wait, the potential for ongoing damage to the spinal cord exists, and it may not be able to be reversed in some cases. Before we get too carried away about the treatment, let's talk about what a disc herniation is. The intervertebral disc is the cushion that sits between the bones in our spine, and that exists in our neck, our thoracic spine, and our lower back, called the lumbar spine. We like to simplify what a disc is and I compare it to a jelly donut. It has a hard outer coating called an annulus fibrosus, and the inside is called the nucleus pulposus. That's a little softer. If we look at the science, the annulus fibrosus is primarily type one collagen, and the inside or the softer material is primarily type two collagen. The inside or the nucleus has a higher water content, and that makes it softer and more squishy. For some reason in life, whether from an injury or just degenerative changes over time, you can get weakness of the annulus and sometimes the nucleus can then subsequently leak out and that can compress the nerves or sometimes even the spinal cord itself. One thing I mentioned in the beginning video is that when he turned his head to that left side, his symptoms down his arm seemed to get worse and that's called a Sperling's test. That's because when we turn our head to the side of the disc herniation, it can pinch the nerve more and make the symptoms even worse. We actually can perform the Sperling's test in the office to elicit these symptoms to see if we think the patient does have a pinched nerve. You do that by slightly compressing the top of the head or even taking the head and leaning it to that side. And if the patient's symptoms get worse, that's a positive test. It does have a low sensitivity, but it's highly specific and can help confirm the diagnosis. 
I also mentioned which fingers his pain went down, and this can help a doctor help understand which part of the spine may be affected. Here is a diagram that can help explain where a patient's pain is and where their pinched nerve may be. When our patient said his pain is primarily in his ring finger, I'm thinking it might be C7, C8 region, but doctor, there's no C8 vertebrae. You are exactly correct. There is only seven cervical vertebrae and the C8 nerve comes between C7 and T1. Little knowledge for you on Monday. And lo and behold, that's exactly where his compression is. But what do we do to treat this man? If it was just a radiculopathy or a pinched nerve, our treatment plan would be totally different than what it is now because currently he has symptoms of spinal compression and myelopathy. What are her symptoms of myelopathy? And I said that he began to have dexterity weakness or fine motor weakness in his hands, as well as balance troubles. That's a clinical sign of spinal cord compression. Another thing that you can check on clinical examination is his reflexes. And if his reflexes are brisk, that can be also a sign of spinal compression. But fun fact, the compression needs to be there for at least six weeks sometimes to elicit a hyperreflexia. There's something called the Hoffman sign where you can take a patient's finger and flick the end of their finger. And if when you do that, if their hand kind of contracts like this, it can be a sign of spinal compression as well. And that's what your doctor is doing when they check your reflexes. If he had only radiculopathy, I would absolutely recommend that he go see a physical therapist as well as consider epidural injections if the pain was severe because most of the time disc herniations like that may improve with conservative treatment and time as the body heals the disc. He was demonstrating signs of spinal compression and rapidly weakening nerve function. He needs surgery to halt the progression of his symptoms and relieve pressure on the spinal cord. Another complex layer to this case is that his disc herniation is at C7 and T1. For cervical disc herniations, most surgeons will choose an anterior approach where we come anterior in the spine and remove the disc and either do a disc replacement or a spinal fusion. That removes the disc in its entirety and completely addresses the problem without any concerns for a reherniation. And if this man's disc herniation was C7 or above, I would have likely recommended a disc replacement given his young age. However, his is at C7-T1, and in most cases, this is inaccessible from an anterior approach because it's at the base of the spine and the sternum is in the way. There are unique cases in which patients have really long necks and it might make this level really accessible from an anterior approach. But in our patient's case, this was not going to work. Our options are really only a posterior approach and that could be either a fusion or a procedure called a microdiscectomy. I'm gonna walk you through the, his surgery and the approach that we chose to take. This is called a posterior cervical microdiscectomy and foraminotomy. An incision is made on the back of the patient's neck, and then we can access the spine. This shows you the nerve that is compressed, and the surgeon, once we expose the area, can drill away a small window of bone to access the area of interest. Here you can see the nerve that is being pinched by the disc herniation, and the surgeon can go underneath the nerve and remove the fragments of disc that are compressing the nerve. You can see the disc material of the annulus and then the nucleus, and the surgeon removes the fragments of disc that are pinching the nerve and then subsequently can perform a foraminotomy where we open up the foramen where the nerve exits the spine and that will help alleviate the compression on that nerve as well as the spinal cord. And there you have it, the nerve is happy. By doing a discectomy only, he does run a risk long-term of having a recurrent disc herniation and in that case, he may have to have a spinal fusion. A fusion is typically where hardware is inserted to eliminate motion of a part of the spine. But in my mind, preserving motion in a young patient, if we can, is of utmost importance for his overall spine health. Once we decompress the nerve in his spinal cord, he did excellent and most of his symptoms resolved within just a few weeks. In some cases of myelopathy that has been present for quite some time, it can take up to two years to see the maximum benefit of surgery. It's important to know if you're a healthcare provider to recognize the symptoms of cervical myelopathy because those symptoms may be irreversible if not intervened in an appropriate amount of time. Another case of patient-focused and compassionate care. Hopefully you guys learned something this week. Stay tuned next week and I'll go through another case.